All right, so let's see where we were at with MDPs and reinforcement learning. What was an MDP? An MDP was this thing where you had states, which pretty much any problem we've looked at so far has been abstracted as a set of states that you could be in. Then there's a set of actions per state, A. Then in MDPs we have a model. In this model, what it captures is the probability of landing in state S prime at the next time, given that at the current time you were in state S and took action A. So it's a three-dimensional table with numbers between zero and one. There's another three-dimensional table, reward function, which encodes for every possible current state, current action, and next state, what the reward is if you were to experience that triple. We were always looking for a policy, pi. A, pi, a policy pi is a vector with an entry for every state in your state space. So if there's 100 states, the policy pi is a 100-dimensional vector prescribing for each state what the action is that you're supposed to take. The twist in reinforcement learning is that we don't know T or R. We still know they exist. We know there are these three-dimensional tables out there. We just don't know what they are, and so we have to somehow learn about them while we're acting in this state action space. So, in terms of solution techniques, what have we seen? If you know the MDP, you know what T and R are, then we have several things we can do. One thing we can do is compute the optimal value function using value iteration or using policy iteration. In doing so, usually as a side effect, we compute the optimal Q value function along the way, and we find an optimal policy pi star. Those are typically the things we're after. The policy is what we end up using. It's often useful to also know the value. These techniques were just two different ways of getting to the same result. Sometimes one is faster, sometimes the other is faster. Um, so it'll depend on the situation of what you want to use. Then, if we know the policy ahead of time, we saw that we could do something called policy evaluation. This is a lot like value iteration, but you now fix the action by the action prescribed by your policy pi. Aside from that, you can do the same set of updates to find the value of that policy for each state. Alternatively, we saw that once the policy is, a, is fixed, you can also solve a linear system of equations to find the value vector for that policy. Now, when we switch to reinforcement learning, T and R are not known, at least not ahead of time. We know they exist, we don't know what they are. One thing we can do is we say, we just collect experience in the MDP. From that experience, we build an approximation of T and R. And once we've done that, we can go back to use any of the techniques we saw up here. So these are the same techniques as up there, just now applied to the approximate MDP, the one that we estimated from having experienced transitions and rewards in the environment we're acting in. Then we looked at something called empirical averaging, and the example we started out with was computing the expected age of students in the class. We said one thing we can do is first build a model for the distribution over ages, and then from that, model for the distribution, compute the expected value of age, or alternatively, we could just directly average the sample values you get and not first compute the distribution. And we said, can we do the same thing for learning value functions and q-value functions? And the answer was yes. We have ways of directly from experience computing v and q. Um, and we saw a couple of arguments for this. The first thing we looked at was value learning. We had two ways of doing this. One way was by just direct evaluation. It was just, you're in a state, you run a policy, you see what the sum of rewards is, you do this several times, and you just average that, and that's your estimate. We saw the downside of this procedure is that you do this independently for every state, and you don't leverage the fact that if you go from one state to another state, that there is a connection between the values of these states. So we saw an alternative which is called temporal difference learning. In temporal difference learning, we have something like a policy evaluation update, but we do it based on samples. Then we said, well, we're still stuck then with just learning the value of a policy. Can we move to learning the optimal value function? Turned out there was no way to directly learn the optimal value function V star, but there was a way to directly learn the optimal value function Q star. That was called Q learning. And of course, once you have Q star, you can find V star from that, and you can find pi star, the optimal policy from that. Q star is, 
the algorithm we'll build on top of today. So Q learning will find us Q star. And let's uh, look at a reminder of how this worked. You have this sequence of state, action, reward, next state, action in next state, reward for the next transition, next, next state, and so forth. At every transition, you update your estimate of your value function, in this case, the Q value function, very similar to the Bellman equation updates. And this is what it looked like. This was our starting point. If we knew the model, if we knew T and R, this is how we could run Q value iteration. Then we said, instead of running it based on the model, which we don't have, let's run it based on samples. How does that work? We have a current running estimate of Q. Then we average that with the current sample that we get. What is this sample? Is the reward we experienced plus gamma, which is the discount factor, times the value for the next state. At least the estimate we have for the value of the next state. The way we estimate that is by the max overall actions in that next state of the Q value for that next state. This alpha here, the closer to one, the more you weigh the current sample. The closer to zero, the more you kind of retain what you already had. So you can imagine that you want your alpha to decay over time, because initially, you have a bad estimate, you want to do big updates to your estimate, and as time goes by, your estimates get better and better, you want to have less and less influence of the current latest sample, because it would just kind of throw things around a little too much. So, any questions about this algorithm? Yes? Okay, it's a terminology difference. So, the terminology difference between model-based and model-free is that your algorithm is called model-based if inside your algorithm, so your algorithm will always, in reinforcement learning, just get this and nothing else. That's all you're getting, whether it's model-based or model-based model or model-free. But if your algorithm is model-based, what that means is that the first thing you do with that experience is building a model. Then it's model-based. If you never build a model, but you try to directly estimate Q values or V values from this sequence of state action, reward state, and so forth, then it's a model-free approach. So this here is a model-free approach because nowhere do we explicitly use the model that we built for T or a model that we built for R. We just keep track of a table of Q values. Any other questions about this? Yes? Say it again? The model is everything that comes into the MDP. So the model consists of the three-dimensional table for transition model T, the reward function R, and then there's a set of states, a set of actions, but that you are given in this case. Yes? The small r? Okay, the small r, what that indicates is that it's not the reward function that you are evaluating. So if it were the big R, that'd be a three-dimensional table that you get the index into. Small r means that you experience the reward. And sometimes it'll be indexed by time to indicate at which time you experienced it, but here we just went with r, and then the next one is r prime, r double prime, and so forth. Okay, so that's Q-learning. Why was this such a, um, let's see, here we go. Ready, hold on. This looks like a repeat. That's just a repeat that we already stepped through. So, what is so great about Q-learning? Why do we really like Q-learning? Well, the beauty is that you can act according to pretty much any policy, and you will still find, through these Q learning updates, the optimal Q value function Q star. So you are somehow learning something about the optimal policy, the values of the optimal policy, without ever having to know what it is or ever having to execute it. That's called off-policy learning, and that's a big deal. That's what makes it so appealing in that it can allow us to find the optimal policy without having any idea of what it might be. So let's take a look at what that looks like in action. So what we have here is our standard grid world. Whenever it's a state from which you can only take the exit action, only one action is available, you just see one number in that state. 
If it's a state where you have the four standard actions available, north, east, south, west, then there is four numbers in that state. These are the Q values. What we'll look at here is Q learning in action. So it's just kind of running some policy with a bunch of randomness in it. And as it goes along, you'll see that the values get updated. So here is Q learning in action. What have we seen so far? We've seen so far that there is something good at the end there, um, some bad stuff down here. At this point, Q learning doesn't know that this is a bad state. We know that from looking at the problem. We know how these problems are set up. But keep in mind, Q learning doesn't know that. It's never visited that state before, so it still has the original estimate of zero. And at some point, it might visit it and just get just a really bad reward, and that's part of the learning process. So it's going around, updating values. And one thing we observed last time, which was really interesting, is that we see that it's good to go all the way right, but even if periodically we jump into the pit, that bad reward that we get there will not affect the fact that we think going right is good. So even if we go right twice and then jump into the pit, these actions of going right will still get increased in value, because when you use the update, the Q learning update, you will not end up using the update based on jumping in the pit, you'll use the value that's the best value for a given state. So even when there are bad things happening in a certain state, that will not necessarily propagate back. Only if that's the best thing that could happen in that state will that propagate back to previous states. And so over time, we see values fill in. We also see that this can take a while before it's seen all the states. Some states have been barely visited, so the values are still more or less meaningless at this point. But you can, in principle, keep running this, and at some point, it will have visited all states, Sufficiently often, it'll have converged. Okay, so what are the caveats here? We saw this in action. It can take a long time to run. So the need, that you need, the need for exploration is still there. We've said whatever you do, as long as you visit every state sufficiently often, it's fine. You still need to find a way to do that, and ideally you do it efficiently. Eventually, you have to make the learning rate small enough. Why is that? If you don't make the learning rate small enough, you'll keep jumping around. Just think of um, estimating the probability of a coin flip coming out heads or tails, right? The expected value of that. If heads is minus one, tail is plus one, the expected value of zero is zero. After you've seen many samples, you, your estimate is probably very close to zero. But whatever you're going to see next is going to be a one or a minus one. So if your alpha is too big, you'll move very far away from that zero to the one or the minus one. So your alpha needs to go down to be able to really converge to the average value. Can't go down too quickly, because if it does that, if initially you have a weird streak, then you can never make up for it in the future, because you don't have enough leverage in the future because your alpha became too small. In the limit, that's the beauty. It doesn't matter how you select your actions as long as you satisfy these properties. All right, we saw this demo. So the question that we now have to answer is one of, how do you decide to explore versus exploit? And think of this as a real world scenario here. You have your favorite restaurant in Berkeley, let's say, that you go to very frequently. Here again, it's time to go out. And you could go to your usual place, favorite food, guaranteed. But next door, there is this grand opening of a new place. You have to make a decision. You've never been there. You don't know what it's going to be like. You know you're pretty much guaranteed the usual place will be really good. I mean, you're guaranteed it's going to be really good. You just don't know if the new place might still be better because you have never been there. Most likely it's worse because the old place is so good, but it could be better. So the only way you're going to find out is by trying it out. When you try it out, you'll find out. It could actually give you food poisoning. It was a really bad choice. But that's part of exploration, right? So that's the, the thing we have to keep in mind. As long as you haven't seen it, you just can't know what it would be like. So let's take a look at exploration in action here. We're looking at a different scenario here. So this is what we call the bridge world. You'll see that in your project three. We can see what's going on here, but the agent actually doesn't know this. Keep that in mind, right? The agent has no idea that this is a bridge running in the middle, and on the sides there are, you fall off the cliff. It's really bad. And that there is a really good reward at the end. 
and a medium reward up front, the agent doesn't know anything about that. As far as the agent is concerned, it's just a bunch of states. And then you can start acting in this world. And let's say you go left first. You see the Q value update for going left. It gets better and better. Now you have to make a decision. Are you going to keep going left, which gives you a reward of one, or should you go check out other things? Right? Maybe we should go check out other things sometime soon, because maybe there's a better reward out there. You definitely can, at this point, you cannot guarantee that this is the best thing to do. You just know it's probably a good thing to do, but definitely not, no guarantee that it's the best thing to do. So let's see what happens when we start going the other way. Let's accelerate this. Oops, off the cliff. Again, only once you fell into the cliff does the agent figure out that that was a bad thing to do. Huh? There's a big reward at the end if you exit there. So that could be a reasonable thing to do. But yeah, it's one thing to go there and keep collecting that reward. But in the meantime, you still have no idea what would happen in a lot of these other states. Maybe they have a good reward. As far as we are concerned, it could be that there's a really good reward at the bottom of one of these cliffs, top or bottom. Not for this one. Not for that one, not for that one. So you see that it's kind of a, a painful experience. You, while you're exploring, you might have a lot of negative rewards that don't get you anything, but it's the only way to guarantee that you will eventually find the optimal policy because you've ruled out that anything else could still be good. So how do you explore? and try to balance that trade-off between exploration and exploitation. The one thing we need to keep in mind is that we, to guarantee after running for a long time that we have the optimal Q values Q star, we need to visit every state action pair sufficiently often. So that's the main thing we need to keep in mind. And while doing so, hopefully we don't incur too much damage, right? So one thing we could do is say epsilon greedy. What does that refer to? That means that you have some number epsilon, and with probability epsilon, you just act randomly. And with probability one minus epsilon, you do whatever your current Q value says is the right thing to do. If your epsilon is close to one, you do a lot of exploration, not a lot of exploitation, and the other way around. So let's look at that in action for the crawler robot. Not willing to let me do it. Here we go. No, wrong one. Here we go. This is the crawler. What's happening here at this point? At this point, we have a epsilon of 0 0.8. That's what's shown down here. What that means is that 80% of the time when an action is chosen, it's chosen randomly. Only 20% of the time are the Q values being followed. So imagine there's going to be a lot of exploration, a lot of learning about how the system works, but maybe not a whole lot of progress off to the right where you want to get, right? You get positive reward from moving right. Um, so you just see a lot of exploration. And we might want to you know, speed up this exploration a little bit by skipping over some steps, but so at some point, you hope you skip over enough steps, it will have learned a good Q function, but it's still not making any progress. Why is that? Well, it's still 80% of the time taking random actions. It might have a really good Q function, but it's not using it. If we now were to lower that epsilon and start really exploiting what we learned, then we'd start getting more interesting results. So let's wait till we lower epsilon here. This is just 80% random. We lower it down to zero. Now you see what would happen if you were to exploit, and it's actually doing really well already. So we see that after we accelerated this by a million, step, million steps at one point in the video, right? So after over a million steps of exploration, here's what it learned, and it's crawling forward pretty steadily. Okay, so what are the problems with these random actions? Well, eventually, the good thing is eventually you explore the entire space, but you can keep thrashing around for a long time before you've done that. And in the meantime, you are just doing random stuff. You're not collecting any good rewards along the way, or at least you're not trying to. 
So one solution would be to say, well, as learning progresses, maybe I should lower epsilon. Right? You think that lower epsilon as you've done more learning, and then you can do more exploitation, less exploration, and maybe this will still work. And actually, you can do that. That's not a bad strategy. But you can do something better that we'll look at now. We, do something, we can use something called exploration functions. If you think about lowering epsilon, let's think back to just the idea of lowering epsilon. Let's say we had some high epsilon, lots of exploration. We think we were doing a good amount of learning. We lower it, so we do more exploitation. Seems the right thing. But the problem is that it might be that in one part of the state space, you're ready to exploit, but in another part of the state space, you haven't explored much yet. And so you want to tune how much exploration you do to where you are in the state space, rather than just have this global parameter, epsilon, that just is setting how much exploration anywhere you might be. Right? Any state action pair you've barely seen, you need to explore to find out what happens there. So the idea here is that, and this is a very often reoccurring idea in reinforce, reinforcement learning, is that you follow this principle of optimism in the face of uncertainty. That means that if you have access to a state action pair that you have a lot of uncertainty about, you just assume it's going to be really good, the outcome, and act according to that assumption. If you've seen th something many times before, well, you have statistics on how good or bad it's going to be, and you just work with that estimate that you have from there. So what that means is whenever something looks even still a little bit uncertain, you're just going to jump into it, go explore that cave. You might still encounter bad things. You'll still see bad things. Otherwise, you haven't explored everything. But once you know something's bad, you're not going to explore it again. So how do you do this in practice? Here's one way to do this. We have a new function here, f. This is going to modulate how much we're going to explore. So what you keep track of is a visit count n. So we consider a particular state action pair. How often you've been for in a particular state action pair. For that particular state action pair, you have a count n. So this table n has entries for all s and a. And you'll use it for a particular state action pair. Then you have this constant k, which is just an offset. And you have your original utility. U. And you say the utility that I'm going to associate with SA is utility estimate that I have for SA plus a bonus. And that bonus encodes how much uncertainty I have about S and A. That bonus is some factor K divided by N, which is how often you've, you have experienced SA. So the more you've experienced SA, the less bonus you get. So in a Q learning update, the regular thing would look like this. You update, what this means is a alpha update. So you have the original estimate, you weighted by one minus alpha, and you add on alpha times what's on the right hand side here, which is the reward you experience, plus gamma times the max of real actions in the next state of the Q value function. You're going to replace this thing over here with something else that's optimistic in the face of uncertainty. We're going to place that function f around it. f is sitting here now. q is in here. q is the utility part. It continues to contribute, but you add a bonus that encourages exploration. And that bonus, nsa, this is the n up here. And then there's some factor k that's fixed. That doesn't show up in the expression because it's fixed for the entire process. So what happens here is that when you are now choosing an action, you can just look at this modified version of your Q functions where you use this bonus in the face of uncertainty. You compute the optimal action with respect to this thing over here and take the action accordingly. One thing that happens is you will explore in your current state if there are actions that still have a lot of uncertainty associated with them. Another effect is that because you also use it in the Q learning update here, you get a propagation through your state space of this bonus. So if there's a state really far out that you don't know much about, once you visit that state, the exploration bonus that is associated with that state will then be propagated through Q learning to the state you were in before you were visiting that state. Next time you travel in that direction, it'll propagate one further back and so forth. 
So you get a propagation of these exploration bonuses throughout your entire Q value table. And that will encourage you to not only take an action that has a lot of uncertainty associated with it, but it'll actually encourage you to take actions that lead you to parts of the state space where there is still a lot of uncertainty. So you get a very directed exploration here, where even for a state where you already know everything, you might still decide to take an action that's technically exploration because it's leading you to a state that you haven't seen yet. So this is a much more clever way of doing exploration than just epsilon greedy. Yes? Alpha is what this arrow means here is something like this. If I write, let's say, x alpha, um, let's call this thing s, what that, that is the same thing as saying x becomes 1 minus alpha times x plus alpha times s. So that's the notation. Yes? Okay, that's a good question. You have a choice there. The simplest thing is to have one global alpha, which will actually depend on how long you have been running, because you want it to decay over time. There are other implementations where your alpha, last time we said something about, if K, let's say, I keeps track of how many updates you have done, how many experiences you've had, then we could have alpha indexed by i, and it could be, for example, one over i, such that it decays over time, but not too quickly. You could have something more clever. You could have something where your alpha is equal to one over n s prime a prime, something like that. Actually, let's see. It would be s a, not s prime a prime where you keep track of how often you've seen that particular state action pair, and based on that, wait how much you want to update. This would often work better. It's a little more bookkeeping to implement, but it's more tailored to every particular state action pair how much you're going to update. Yes? It cannot. So we should update this slide to say R and R. You're right. Okay, so this is Q learning with a very guided exploration strategy. Let's see how that works on our crawler. So epsilon here, um, doesn't really play a role because we're using exploration functions to do the exploration. Initially, there's a lot of exploration happening because we don't know yet a whole lot about the states, so you have that exploration bonus that tells you explore, that's the right thing to do. But then relatively quickly, and note that we didn't skip any time steps here like we did in the other run, um, this is starting to move off to the right. It's still doing some exploration along the way because it doesn't know everything yet, but you can see that it's already starting to exploit very quickly and doing the right thing very quickly. You'll get to play with the crawler, you'll get to play with the grid world, with the bridge world, all of them in your project three. Okay, so now that we've seen two different ways of doing exploration, one was epsilon greedy, another one was exploration functions, we could wonder how do we quantify whether one is better than the other. Both of them are guaranteed that in the limit, you're going to do the right thing. You find Q star. So which one is better? We think the one with the exploration function is, is better. So how do we write that out formally? Well, that's the notion of regret. So even when you learn the optimal policy, along the way you're going to make mistakes. Keep this in mind here, right? Looking at this picture, what are you seeing? This is the robot now. This is the robot thinking back to the good old days when he was a little child robot and still learning about fire pits and how they really hurt. And maybe with some regret, thinking that wasn't the greatest thing. I had a lot of pain at the time. But right now, after a lot of learning, it knows what the right thing to do is. And so what regret quantifies is when you look back, when you've learned the optimal policy and you quantify, well, Compared to the optimal policy, 
how much less reward did I get during my exploration? Right? You could say, if I had been optimal from day zero, how much reward would I have gotten on expectation because it's stochastic versus because I had to explore, I needed to incur some painful rewards before I really knew how the system worked, I will not have gotten as much. And so the optimal way of exploring is that exploration strategy that on expectation is closest to as if you had been acting optimally all along from the beginning. No optimal exploration strategy will be really close to that because there's no way around that you need to explore, you need to experience a bad reward before you know that state action has a bad reward. But you quantify it by how far you are off. And so with exploration functions we saw we can be, at least in the example with the crawler, we can be much less far off from the optimal thing, get there very quickly, so that's a better way of doing exploration. It incurs less regret. Okay, let's take a quick break here, and after the break, let's look at approximate Q learning. Um, let's take a look at approximate Q learning. So we're going to change the algorithm a little bit, make it approximate, but there's going to be a reason that we want to make it approximate. Let's look at the motivation first. Let's say you have some experience, some sequence of states, action, reward, state, action, reward, and so forth. And from that, you learn that this situation over here is pretty bad. Because you are getting cornered by the ghost, and soon thereafter, you're dead, and that value has propagated back. You realize this is a bad state to be in. Okay, that's great. Q-learning is supposed to do that. A little later, you're still running your Q-learning agent, and this happens. In naive Q-learning, the way we've been doing it so far, the fact that you know this is a bad situation doesn't mean that you know this is a bad situation. Your Q function is just a table of values, one value for each state and action, and this is a different state, so the fact that you've seen this other state with ghosts around you that was pretty bad doesn't tell you anything about this state over here. Q-learning will not somehow transfer that information that this is bad. There's no mechanism for that. They're all separate Q values. Even worse, look at this situation here. What has changed? Well, you need to look very carefully to see what has changed between the first one the third one, then one dot has changed. For Q learning, there's no such mechanism of saying just that one dot has changed. All it has is yet another state. So this Q value would still be at the initial value potentially, whereas this Q value could already be at the right value, namely some really negative value. So that's bad. Because that means from experiencing something very similar, you don't learn anything. You need to actually experience everything before you learn. That's a bad way to go, right? Let's see how well this works. So we'll start with just generic Q learning. This is in a very small world, and we'll watch the entire process here. So we'll watch the entire Q learning process. Okay. Ah, I win there. So, it's exploring, it's exploring. The ghost is enjoying this a lot. <laughs> so that's what happens. You know, it has been acting for a couple of times now. Every now and then it succeeds, but it still doesn't really know what the winning strategy is. Um, let's look at this now after having skipped over 2,000 learning trials, so 2,000 runs until Pac-Man won or died. See what happens. Let's actually see it in action. Here we are. So after 2,000 trials, it's pretty good. But let's think about this. So that's a nice result, but how many states are there here? Pac-Man could be in any of six positions. The ghost could be in any of six positions. There are 36 states and four actions. So this is very, very, very small problem. And it took about 2,000 episodes here to learn to act in this small problem. Let's look at another problem, just slightly bigger. Watch it learn. 
Still hasn't won, hasn't been able to learn. <laughs> So with a reasonable ghost, it's going to take a really, really long time before Pac-Man ever experiences something good that it could learn from, right? This is not going to work very well. So what was the problem? When we see a bad situation, we learn that's a bad situation. But when we see a similar situation, we don't realize it's, it's an equally bad situation most likely. That's because we keep track of a table of Q values and don't connect the values in the table with each other. So think of it as, for a small problem, sure, you have your book, your table of Q values, right? Um, your early six situations, however, you cannot hold all of these in memory. There is just too many states. Moreover, aside from not being able to hold them in memory, you might not want to learn for so long that you need to experience all of these state action pairs many times before you finally learn what the value is in those, for those state action pairs. So think of it like this, right? You have an entire library you need to keep track of, not only keep track of, but also experience before you can learn something. Okay, so we want to generalize. This is a very generic thing in machine learning, and we'll see a lot of machine learning at the end of the course, but we'll see a little glimpse of machine learning now. So what's fundamental about machine learning is that you somehow see examples of something, and then see new examples, and whatever you were able to say about the first examples, you want to generalize to these new examples. That's the generic problem that, we're after, that we want to solve here. Okay, so how could we do that? Think back to the project you just finished last week. You did something like that already there. You weren't able to search till the bottom of the game tree. You stopped at some point. When you stopped, you used an evaluation function. You didn't look up in a table for what that stored for each state, what the values of that state. No, you had some function that encoded how good a state could be. What could go in there? Things like distance to Distance to the closest ghost, distance to the closest dot, number of ghosts that are in the game, one over distance to dot nearest dot squared, is Pac-Man in a tunnel, which could be a zero one feature, and so forth. Um, you could put even more specific features in there. You could say, does it exactly match the state shown over here? That's allowed. You can make that a feature. But the key idea in making features is that you want to make features that are not specific to just one state. Because then they're only going to be useful for that one state. Ideally, you have features that have general applicability. You know being close to dots is generally good. Being close to ghosts is generally bad, and so forth. So you want to pick features that reflect what in general would be a good or a bad thing, potentially. And then maybe learn whether they're good or bad as you go along. So what we're going to do now is describe two states with features. So rather than storing a table of values, we'll have features and combine those features to predict what the value is of a Q state. So in the minimax search or alpha beta search, you would have had a value for a state would look like this. It took the weighted sum of the features to get a value out. We'll do the same thing here. Now these features will depend on both state and action. Could you still just have them depend on the state? Well, if you want to do that, you kind of want them to depend on the next state that you likely land in after taking that action, right? So another way to work with this is to work with F1 of S prime. In general, there will be several S prime, so then it will be something where it's some F1 of maybe the set S prime and the probabilities associated with each of those next states. So that's another way if you want to restrict yourself to encoding it as a function of states, which often is easier, then you would have to account for the action you take to do that. But in general, this is the format. You have states and actions, and the features as a function of those states and actions. And then you weight them, sum them together, that's your Q value. What's the advantage? All you need to learn now is these weights, W1 through Wn. And often you can get away with maybe even 100 weights, even when you might have billions of states. The disadvantage is that, well, you have some form of aliasing now. What do I mean with that? You could have two different states that have the same feature values. If that's the case, if two different states have the same feature values, then no matter how you choose the weights, 
they will have the same Q values, right? So you need to be careful about how you pick your features such that if states do end up with the same or even very similar feature values, they better be very similar states in terms of how you think about us, how good they are. So we lose some generality here, but we gain this idea that we just have to learn a couple of numbers that now will generalize over the entire state space. We don't know yet how to learn those weight entries w i yet. So we have a Q function as follows. When we see a transition, we get s a r s prime. The difference is what we compute in regular Q learning. And then we do an update based on that difference. Right? We say new Q value is the old one plus alpha, which is your weight, how much you want to update, times the difference. We now need to do something similar but our Q values aren't stored in a table. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to update each weight, because that's all we can do is update weights. We can't update Q values directly. And for one weight entry, WI, this is the update equation. We keep what it was, plus alpha times, and then this expression over here. What is that expression saying? It still has the difference in it. Let's look at that part first. Just the difference, that's what we had before. If it were just a table of Q values, we just updated by alpha times the difference. That's still part of it, meaning that if we have an error, the sample is different from the estimate right now, we will change something. We don't just change by the difference, we also look at the feature value. Let's think of an extreme case. Let's think of the case where our features are always zero or one. And for some of the weights, the feature will have been zero. What does that mean if your feature value was zero? Then when you computed the Q value over here, that feature didn't contribute. And as a consequence, the weight sitting in front of that feature didn't play a role. So you really have no reason to update that weight. That weight didn't do anything wrong if the feature value was zero. You want to just keep it as is because you learned it from previous experience. There's no reason to update it based on this experience now because it didn't contribute to the, to the error. On the other hand, if your feature value was very high, let's say for now it's 0 and 1, so 1 would be the high value, then it did contribute to your computation of Q, so it did contribute to it being wrong, and then you want to update it. And so then this would be 1, and you update it by the difference. Now, this reasoning doesn't just hold true when you have 0 and 1. Imagine a feature value could be minus 1. If it were minus 1, then you actually want to shift that weight in the opposite direction because the feature was negative. It was contributing in the opposite direction than the normal direction, right? And so what will happen here is by multiplying with minus one, you will actually move in the direction that you need to move because the feature has a flipped sign. In general, you will scale your update by the size of the feature, including the sign, and that will allow you to essentially put the blame of the error on features that had high absolute values and make those weights change a lot. Why? Because those features are really the ones that contributed to this computation here. Yes? Good question. The difference is still computed this way over here. Of course, when we look at these values here, we will not have a table to look those up in. We will actually need to use this type of expression to evaluate those. Yes? That's a good question. So something that's really important in machine learning is how you choose your features. The features you come up with will determine what you're able to learn. If you have a very good set of features that have the right generalization properties, you'll learn really well. If you have just arbitrary features, you'll, re you'll learn really poorly. One of the things that is typically done in machine learning when you use features is if a priori you don't know which are the important ones, you think they're all about equally important, you make sure they're all on the same scale. So you have some idea of what the scale should be, right? You, you pick it, you say one is my scale, I want them all, let's say all features should always be between minus one and one. It's something you could pick as the way you scale things. Then you would, for your feature, see what is the maximum value I could ever achieve, and then you would normalize your feature by that maximum value to put it on the right scale. If you don't do that, the problem is that features that happen to be live on a very large scale, will dominate these updates and will just swing things around 
very quickly and it'll be really hard to learn things well. In practice, by the way, the way it's often done, rather than analytically computing what the maximum value is of the feature, which can be hard, you just collect data, compute features, and then empirically just see what the maximum value was, or sometimes the standard deviation is computed. And what you do is you subtract the mean, and then divide by the standard deviation to normalize your features. Okay, so that's our update. We now know how to do it. Um, the interpretation is that active features are the ones that those weights will get updated the most, and that seems to make sense. So let's take a look at how this runs. We'll soon look at the actual justification. So we have a Q function right now. We're in a initial situation. We take the action north. Um, so what was the Q value for S comma north? Well, F dot is 0 0.5 times 4 is 2, and then 1 times minus 1 is minus 1, so we land at plus 1 as the Q value. That's our estimate, based on the current set of weights. Take the action, we get a reward. We have then to compute the Q value in the next state. Um, since we die, the Q value there is 0, the game is over, there's nothing anymore in the future, we already got that losing penalty right here. So our sample value is the reward minus 500 plus the max overall Q values at the next state, which is zero. And so we have an error of 501. Keep track of the sign of the error. So the difference here is minus 501. That's appearing over here as a difference. We have the original weights over here. And then this here is the feature values. We had 0 0.5 and 1 as feature values. So this is our Q learning update for approximate Q learning. We have a weighted combination of features as our representation. And this is our, after updating, our new approximate Q function. All right, let's see how this works. Say that again? What was alpha? Alpha is always the learning rate. So the closer to zero, the slower you update, the less update you have, which you might want once you've already learned a lot. And the closer to one you want initially because then you get a lot of update into your um, weight vector here. So this is a much bigger situation. This is a full board, right? Lots of states. You've counted these kind of states. It depends on where, where, the food pallet, where there are food pallets and so forth. So many, many, many states. We're doing Q learning with a feature-based representation of the Q value. And we're seeing this from the beginning, actually. So here it, it learns running into a ghost is a bad thing. It knew that it tried to escape, but I guess I hadn't learned yet that being close to a ghost was bad and you need to stay away from it. So it's doing pretty well already. This is just the third episode. Look at that. That's nice, right? Why, didn't, why is it not eating the power pellets? There could, be, there could be several reasons. Yeah, two good things were brought up. One thing is, if there's no feature about power pellets, no way to learn anything about them, ever. Another reason is, if it never experienced a power pellet, then it just doesn't realize that a power pellet is a useful thing to go get. So, as far as it knows for now, a power pellet could be good or bad. All right, so this works really well. Between those two reasons, can we infer what's going on here between the two reasons? Whether it's because it doesn't have a feature for power pellet or whether it's just never experienced it. I have to seen it run for several runs. We can't know for sure, but let's say we run epsilon, some epsilon greedy, or this was better than that, this was an exploration function. If you had an exploration function, it would draw you to things you don't know about yet. Well, in a state space like this, pretty much everything you don't know about yet, so that's not very useful. So to generalize that concept, you need to be drawn 
to activate features that you haven't seen activated yet, right? That's how you need to generalize the concept of optimism in the face of uncertainty. Going to states that have features very active that you haven't seen very active yet. The math is a little more complicated to keep track of that, but the intuition is the same. If it's indeed doing that, which it is, it's clearly exploring in a clever way, then if it has a feature for a power pellet, eating, eating a power pellet, it would be drawn towards that, and it would go eat it. So after I've seen this a couple of times, we know that it most likely doesn't have a feature for a power pellet, because a good implementation of an exploration function would be drawn towards features you haven't experienced yet. Okay, so here's a justification for what we just did. What we've seen so far is an example of machine learning, and I presented to you an update that made a lot of sense. We said we're going to blame those weights where the features were very active, because those weights had the chance to do something better for us. More formally, what's going on is something called least squares. What is least squares? You might have seen this before. You have a bunch of points. You want to fit a line through that bunch of points, and you find the line that has the least squared error, right? So it's also called linear regression. What do you do? You have a function. And for that function, you assume a form. And the form we assume is a weight w0 plus a weight w1 times f1 of x. If this, this axis here is f1 of x. That's what we're doing when we're representing this q function as a weighted combination of features. It's as if the axes, the independent axes are the features, and then there's a function living on top of that we're trying to fit. Here is a two-dimensional version with and in the function value, value living in the third dimension. So this is f1 of x. This is f2 of x. And then this is y. What we try to do is find the weights w such that our function is a good approximation of the dots, the samples we've seen. The standard thing to do in least squares is to look at the error or the residual. Think of the function as a prediction of what the value ought to be. Look at how far it's off, and that the more it's off, the worse. That error is what we're going to drive as low as possible. So formally, what does that mean? We take the square of the error, because that happens to make the math work out nicely. We take the square of the error, y i hat is the prediction, and this is the sample value that you got to observe, and we want to drive that difference to zero. We can't drive it completely to zero because, well, there is no line that fits through all these points. We find the line that has the smallest sum of squares. So another way to write this, explicitly writing out the prediction part, is to write the prediction as the sum over the weights times the feature values. OK, so how do you minimize that error? And one thing I want to point out here is whenever a slide has a star on it, it means that this is something we find important to tell you about, but it's not something we expect you to fully understand necessarily, and we're not going to quiz you about this on an exam. But we do want you to get the, at least the gist of this, so we want to include it in lecture. So how do we get something that minimizes that error? Well, imagine you had only one point, and the features were f of x. The target value is y, and the weights are w. Well, then the error as a function of w, because w is what we get to tweak, the error as a function of w would be this expression over here. How would you drive the error down? Well, one thing you can do is you can take derivatives. You say, how should I change the entry m, the mth entry, into w? Well, I take the derivative of this error function with respect to wm and see what it is. That derivative tells me if it's a very high positive value, that means that increasing that entry wm will increase the function value a lot, and decreasing that will decrease the function value a lot. So it's telling you how sensitive your function is to that entry wm, and also the sign of that sensitivity. So then we could say, well, the way we update this is by saying, well, we have an error in the prediction is what we said, and then a feature value. 
That's the same thing we have over here. So we see that the update we intuitively came up with is an update that says update by the derivative. Now you go the opposite direction than the derivative is pointing you because you want to go downhill, not uphill. But you look at this, that's our standard update, error plus feature value, times feature value times alpha. And then some weighting here, right. So we see that the standard update we've been looking at can be derived as a least squares update if you were to look at just one sample. So same thing here, we have target, prediction, the difference, multiply with the feature value, and then the step size alpha over here. So this is a justification, an alternative justification for why we have the update that we had earlier on by looking at it as a least squares fitting problem, as if we get samples from the Q function and fit in a least squares fit to it with our representation sum over weights times feature values. Okay, so that's our justification. Then you could say, one question you could ask yourself, well, definitely the more feature values, the richer a function I can fit. So why not have many, many, many feature values so I can fit very complicated functions if needed? You could still set the weights to zero, right? So you can still fit simple functions too. Why wouldn't we do that? Well, that's kind of at the core of machine learning and what machine learning is a lot, a concern with a lot is that once you start having a lot of feature values, it can be really hard to extract the right weight vector because now you have a lot of these things that could contribute and you don't know what to attribute the error to. And so having additional feature values could make things a lot worse. Having too many feature values could make the learning a lot harder. So the more feature values you have, the more data you're going to need to be able to learn the right weight factors. So there's a trade-off there where you need to, yes, you need good features, but you can't have too many. Because if too many for the amount of data, you'll start overfitting. And let's look at an example here. Let's say the feature values were, let's say this is x, and f0 of x is 1. f1 of x is x. f2 of x is x squared. f3 of x is x to the third and so forth, f15 of x is x to the 15. And our function, our predictions will be of the form sum over k equal 0 to 15 w k f k of x. So a 15th order polynomial is what we would be fitting here to these data points. Let's see what we get. Here's what we get. That's what least squares fit the best fifth degree 15 polynomial. Is it what you want? Probably not. I mean, this kind of stuff here and here, that's overfitting. That's because it wants to fit to your data and it has the additional degrees of freedom to do so. It comes out with these weird outcomes here. If you had a lot more data, it would straighten those out. If you had a lot of data points living over here, it wouldn't do that. But this shows you that you need to trade off the capacity, the number of features with the amount of data you have. You need to be really careful about having too many features. Okay, here is a cartoon example of this. Too many features, you might as well just have this guy draw the line through your points. It's gonna be equally good. Here's something else that's gotten really good results in reinforcement learning. It's a little different from what we've looked at so far. It's called policy search. Think of it as you have this big box with policies and you're gonna pull one out, see how good it is. If it's not that good, you're gonna somehow then pick a better one and keep moving around until you find a good policy. What's the problem? Why, why aren't we done yet? Why might we still want this different strategy? Well, let's say you learn your Q values. We know in the limit with tabular representations, they'll be exact, but we know that in practice we don't have tabular representations. We have these approximate Q functions. And what we learn is Q functions are really good at approximating Q values. But what we care about is picking the right action. They're not trying to do that. They're trying to get the Q value right. They're not trying to get you to pick the right action. So they're not zoned in on the problem you're really trying to solve. They're solving something related, but not the actual problem of finding the best possible policy. 
So the priority for Q-learning is essentially modeling Q-values, um, not getting the ordering right between actions. Um, this will come back later in machine learning a lot. The solution to this is to just start to learn policies that maximize rewards, not the values that predict those rewards. So you start with an okay solution. How do you do that? Actually, you might run Q-learning. And after you've run Q-learning, why is Q-learning good? It knows how to connect states that follow after each other. So it's a very efficient way of learning the values. Once you've learned the values reasonably well, you switch to policy search. In policy search, it's the simplest thing you can imagine. You just run with a policy, see what the outcome is. If it's a stochastic system, you run multiple times. You average the sum of rewards. Then you, that's your estimate of the value for the current policy. Then you tweak one of your weights just a little bit. Do this again. If it's better, great, you keep the tweak. If it's worse, you go back to the previous thing. It's just hill climbing. It's really simple. So it won't do well if you start with a bad policy, but if you start with a good policy, you can really tweak it onto the right spot. Um, so it's a lot of nudging, a little bit of nudging, but you need a really good initialization and very few parameters. You might need many runs to evaluate your current policy because there could be stochasticity. And keep in mind, if you have a lot of features, you better start from a good spot or it's going to be impractical. Okay, all this being said, it can do some pretty amazing things. So let's look at what it could do and has done. So what you're going to look at here is a helicopter. <coughs> What's the control problem in flying a helicopter? In a helicopter, you get to push air down. That allows you to stay up. How you push air down, these blades go around and they sweep the through the air and push air down. Now, to actually stay put where you are is really hard. Because all you get to do is push air down. It's very easy to be pushing air down and go a little bit at sideways orientation, and now you'll start falling off because you're just pushing air sideways now. So the way you control a helicopter is actually by pushing down a differential amount of air to the left and the right and the front and the back as you're flying. That's how you control it. That way you can control your orientation. And your tail rotor also can push a varying amount of air, and based on that, your tail can move around. How do you push a varying amount of air down? Well, this blade goes around, and rather than trying to change the speed of the blade, which is really hard, it goes around at 30 times per second, what you do is you change the angle of the blade. If it has a steeper angle, more air gets pushed down, and if it's completely flat, no air gets pushed down. And you do that throughout the cycle, differentially front, back, left, right. Very complicated mechanism, but that's what you do. And you can also change the average angle of the blade, and that determines the overall amount of air pushed down. That's actually how you control these. You don't control these by controlling the RPM of the motor. You control them by the angle of the blades. That also means, that's also why they can react very quickly, which they need to, because these are very unstable problems. If you are for two seconds, have a helicopter in the air for two seconds, don't pay attention. And then you look back uh, two seconds later, most likely that helicopter's gone. It's into the <laughs> ground. Extremely, extremely likely. So it's a very hard problem to control helicopters. You need to be very precise about how you do it. So here's a solution to controlling a helicopter, which is a very hard control problem. <laughs> Why does that work to fly upside down? You control the angle of the blades, right? <laughs> so you just put the negative angle in, you can be upside down. It's actually more efficient to fly upside down. Why is it more efficient to fly upside down? You don't have the thing in the way. <laughs> in, in, uh, in more words, um, there's a body of the helicopter. You pull in air from the top. You push that air down, it happens to go at twice the speed when it's below you than when you pulled it in. Air friction with respect to the helicopter body goes up the faster the air is moving. So if you can put the helicopter body above, then it's the slower air that's coming by the helicopter body, and the faster air that's just going in open airspace. Friction is actually goes with the velocity of the air squared. So you have four times less friction over the helicopter body if you put it above rather than below. All right? So, not only cool, also energy efficient. 
Okay, we are done with part one. What do I mean with that, that we are done? We're done with lectures about part one. There's still a project, there's still a homework, and there's still a midterm. <laughs> so you guys are not done. But starting next lecture, we're switching to part two. And part two will be about probabilistic reasoning. How do we deal with uncertainty? And can we start doing learning from data for large numbers of variables? That's it for today.